Evening, ladies and gents, Simon Brown here. Uh, doing the first of what's going to be a series of a couple of uh, events on know your derivatives. This evening, we're keeping it quite simple, CFDs, indices, and FX. Uh, truthfully, indices and FX are assets, products, rather than a CFD, which is a derivative. We'll delve into that. Um, and then second Wednesday of June, and again in July, we'll go further in. Next week, we've got another as well, but that's more on the trading. So this is more product specific series. And then we'll talk around the trading, which is going to be risk uh, systems and all of that. Um, let's delve in and skip my, that, there it is. Uh, first of all, trading a derivative such as a CFD or a futures or any of those type of products, you can lose more than you start with. I'm going to come back to this a couple of times. But let's get it out there right up front that these are products that uh, you can lose more money. You can put 10 grand in and you could end up losing more than 10. And that, that, that is very, very important that we are cognizant of that risk and uh, comfortable with it. Let's just quickly look at those different risk levels. Right at the bottom is a cash deposit. In truth, I would say not even a cash deposit, money under your bed. And assuming your house doesn't burn down and your kids don't find the money, that's the safest place to put your money. Of course, the problem is, aside from fire and kids, is inflation. You then step up and that would be money in a bank uh, and you're going to earn some interest for it. That interest will be around about the inflation rate, a little higher, a little lower, uh, but certainly not shooting the lights out. Uh, but you've got a fairly low risk environment. Yes, banks go bankrupt occasionally, but even back in the 08 or 09 crisis, you know, we didn't see any of our local banks go down. And in fact, over the last 20 years, uh, basically, it, it, there's been three of them. It's been Sumba, it's been African Bank, which didn't take deposits. Um, and then more recently was VBS, the mutual bank. Fixed interest securities, mutual funds, which in our equivalent is unit trusts, ETFs. Then we get to shares, equity, uh, just buying the vanilla share, the buy and hold strategy. And then right at the top would be those derivatives, which are your uh, higher risk, higher reward. Uh, if you get it right, you make you, you get a better profit from it. If you get it wrong, you take a bigger loss from it. And it's why... When trading derivatives, typically what I say to folks is structure your portfolio, a core of ETFs between 50 to maybe as much as 80 or 90% ETFs, a uh, little bit of equity on top, your preferred shares, and then right at the top of the triangle would be your derivative trading that you're going to be looking at. So let's step back and say, what is a derivative? How do we define that? It's a contract between two parties and agreed upon underlying financial asset. Those assets would typically be commodities, uh, shares, indices, uh, currencies, crypto. It, it can be almost anything. You know, we, you, it, it, I suppose the one definition is it needs to be traded somewhere so that you've got a price. But essentially, it's two parties who agree upon this transaction. And they enable you to go short. In other words, you make money from a falling asset price. So when something goes down, you can still make a profit from that by going short. And I'll delve more into that in a moment. And then they enhance the profit or the loss from the assets move. And that's because we are trading with borrowed money. And that's the margin deposit that we put down and is quite important. So let's delve into some of that. Derivatives generally offer gearing. So they amplify the move. A 10% move in that asset, be it whatever, is a 70% move in the derivative. And I say approximately because it depends. It could be 20, it could be 100, whatever that gearing is. And this is because there is a loan from the counterparty. In other words, you take 70,000 rand of exposure, you buy, you take a position on 70,000 rands worth of shares. And let's use a share as an example. But you don't pay 70,000, you pay 10,000. That is your deposit, your margin. Your risk, your exposure is 70,000. Then if that share in a blink of an eye went to zero, well, you've lost 70,000. You only deposited 10, you've got to put another 60,000 into the account to get your account square. And that's how you lose potentially more money than you start with because of that loan part. Now, depending on, on what the product is and, and, and who the, the, the counterparty is, your 70,000 exposure, as an example, might want 10,000 deposit. It might want 7,000, 3,500. That number is going to vary. Uh, some of the, 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 the uh, also providers will also look at volatility and other such risks. But essentially, you're getting a loan from that provider. So the example, you buy XYZ, whatever it is, it's 25 Rand, but you don't buy the share, you buy the derivative. So you pay, say, a 2 Rand 50 margin. 
That means you're paying a tenth. You've now got effectively gearing off 10 times. It moves higher, you sell at 30 Rand, your profit is five bucks. You bought at 25, you sold at 30, you've made five Rand. That is a 20% move on that XYZ. That 20% 20, 20 move from 25 to 30 is a 20% move. Your profit, however, is actually 200%. Why? Well, you put down two rand fifty, and you made a five rand profit. That is the gearing effect, and that can be amplified. And in this case, it was an easy equation. We're doing a twenty-five rand share, a two rand fifty margin. In other words, your margin is ten percent. In other words, your gearing is ten times. If the margin had been five rand, your margin would have been twenty percent, and your gearing would have been five times. Now, I've ignored a whole bunch of equations here, such as, you know, uh, costs and transaction fees and all of that, just to keep it simple. But th this is important, the gearing, and then the next slide where I come to the, the trading short. And if you've got questions, drop them into the Q&A box. I'll take those if they're time-specific to the point in the presentation. I'll take them now, otherwise we've got time at the end of the presentation. But in essence, this is what that gearing is. And this is the attraction of a derivative. It enables you to enhance the amount of risk that you can take. That is also, therefore, the risk of the derivative because you've enhanced. You've rocked up with 10,000, but you've got 70 or 100,000 rand exposure. You've got a lot more risk on the table than you actually have cash for. If you rock up to buy shares and you've got 10,000 rand, well, you get 10,000 rand shares. And if you happen to be holding a share that goes bust, well, you've lost your 10,000, but you've only lost your 10,000. In the derivative, your risk is high. You can lose more than you start with. The other key point of derivatives is that ability to go short. And this is making a profit from a downward move. The example I did here was a traditional vanilla, what we would call a long trade. You bought at 25, it moved to 30, you took your profit. If it had moved to 20, you would have had it, you would have incurred a loss. But it's nice, it's simple, and it works exactly as it says on the sticker. And that's going long. Going short is where we're now making money from a downward move. You effectively sell what you don't own. So you now have a negative position. And it will show. Where you buy 10 shares, it will show you own 10. You short 10, it will say minus 10. You have a negative position. And if that price falls, you buy back at a lower price, and that difference, that fall, becomes your profit. Now, practically how you do it is you just log on to the platform, and you know, you've got zero open position, and you click sell, and you practically you just sell the share. And it's as simple as that. You sell it, now you've got a negative position, and you're making money as it falls. So an example, the same XYZ at 25 Rand. Margin, two rand fifty, but you sell it rather than buy it. You sell it twenty-five rand, it falls to twenty, and now you buy it back. So your negative holding goes to zero, becomes a flat holding. Your profit is now five rand, which is twenty-five rand where you went short, less the twenty where you exit the position. You've made five rand, and effectively you've made five rand profit on a two rand fifty margin. That's your 200%, but the move in that XYZ was only a 20% move. Again, that is your gearing effect. In this case, the gearing effect is on a short trade. Now, I want to touch a quick a couple of things in trading short, and I'll go into a lot more detail when we do the Trader 101 session next week. Um, short trading is difficult because it's a lot more volatile. Things collapse a whole lot more, uh, a lot faster, you know, the cliche. Uh, you know, things take the stairs up and then they jump out the window to get back down to the bottom. So you can have a, a collapse and then a giant bounce and you just get shaken out. Short trading is difficult. There are times when it becomes easier um, and certainly in the high volatile when we saw towards the end of March when markets were having their fastest collapse since October of 1987, that was certainly uh, not a fun time to be trying to be doing any type of, of, of shorting, but you get the sense from it there. Um, I'm assuming derivatives trading not for beginners. Uh, zero, yes, I, I'm going to talk on that a bit more, and we'll talk about it in the trading. I typically say to folks, don't start with derivatives. You know, get yourself smart around markets, and then we can jump into the, de the derivative space. But we don't want to sort of start there because you're right. You know, let's be honest, if you're a newbie to the market, you're now trading with borrowed money. 
that takes extra risk. But everyone happy with the idea of how we go short and that gearing effect. Those are the two key components that we see and, and have within derivatives that are the important components and why derivatives are attractive for, for many, many traders. And I want to stress the word there, traders is distinct from an investor. An investor buys an equity, checks on it every couple of months, maybe every you know, twice a year or something, sees how the results are going, enjoys the dividends, and sells it in a couple of decades' time, in a perfect world. For a derivative trader, and you, you can take that trade and you can be done in, 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 in literally minutes, hours, maybe days, couple of weeks at the most. I mean, sure, I've, you know, some trades will run maybe weeks and months, but typically it's a much shorter time horizon and your room for error is a lot smaller. You know, if I'm going for a long-term position that I'm going to hold for decades uh, without paying an extra rand or two for the share, not the end of the world. If I'm doing that in the trade, in this example here, if I'm slipping by a rand or two on either side, my profits can completely disappear in the process. So then types of der derivatives. <clears throat> Uh, Connor, will the platform require to have cash available in the case of a shortfall due to the leverage position? Connor, great question. Short answer, no. So obviously you need that margin money. So if we go back to this example here, you've deposited 10,000 Rand, you're then able to use that 10,000 Rand as margin. That in essence is your deposit. And what that deposit then means is that's a security, a collateral to the, to, to, to the platform. If that, that 10,000 becomes zero, the platform will start closing you out automatically. And what I mean by closing you out is that they will exit your positions. They don't want you to go negative. They don't want you to owe them money. So as you start to get down to that zero in your account, your margin has been eaten, they will start to close positions to protect, truthfully, both yourself and the platform. Uh, David, some online brokers not offer shorts in the current market, limitation which definitely differentiates bro brokers at the present. Uh, David, I agree absolutely. So, <clears throat> some brokers don't offer shorts across the entire range, and then and particularly when the markets got volatile back towards the end of March, they withdrew shorts on certain instruments, um, and some were more aggressive in withdrawing in others. And I concur with you, you know, when, when looking at platforms, see what their policies are in terms of, of shorts. I mean, read one from Think Markets, they, got, they do 35 local stocks, they got shorts in all of them. As a trader, you want to be agnostic. You know, I don't mind, I have no skin in this game in terms of, of is that stock going up or down? My interest is, you know, I just need to determine the trend and I want to be able to trade either way. There's no fun in you, you, you do your technical analysis, you come to a decision, you want to short a particular product and you can't. They don't offer shorts on it, so so you want that 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 range and that ability to be able to short as and as and when you that you want absolutely. So just clearing up the questions, perfect. So let's go that way. Types of derivatives. So most popular two types of derivatives. Most popular is a contract for difference, a CFD. They, they arrived in South Africa about 13 years ago. A couple of key points for contract for difference. I'm just going to call it a CFD, which is the, the, the short for, they don't have an expiry date. Uh, your interest paid, and I'm going to touch on that in a bit, is received or paid daily. Uh, dividends will be paid. Margin or deposit is required. They're traded over the counter. So these are not traded on the JSC or New York Stock Exchange. And I'll come to that point in more detail in a couple of slides. And they can be issued over pretty much any traded act, uh, asset. We're going to see them on shares, indices, commodities, FX. And they simple pricing. They simple pricing in that they trade at spot. Now, what I mean by that, if a share is trading at 25 Rand, you will enter that CFD at 25 Rand. You will pay 25 Rand for the CFD. However, remember, you've been given a loan. You arrived with 10,000, you've taken a 70,000 position. Essentially, you have been loaned 60,000 Rand by that platform. They're going to charge you interest. That interest will then be charged daily. So every day it will be taken out of your account, that interest on the, 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 the 60,000 that you are effectively loaning. And that's only if you've you know, maxed out in totally, but you will be charged interest. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that interest is then paid if you are short and sorry, paid if you are, are, are long and received if you are short. And that will happen on a daily process. What it means for CFDs is that the pricing is nice and simple and clean. 
We trade at that at that spot price we see in the market. There's no bells and whistles. The the sort of alternative is futures, which was prior to CFDs, it was all about futures. In, in the equity space, uh, futures have largely disappeared in the South African environment, and it's now all about uh, 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 CFDs. A couple of key differences. The future has an ex an, a set expiry date. That is the third Thursday of every quarter, March, June, September, and December. And if you want to hold post that expiry date, what that effectively means is you have to roll over, there'll be an extra charge for exiting the one contract and entering the other, etc. Your interest is not paid daily, it's essentially paid up front. So the interest is paid up front to the expiry of the contract, and if you exit early, it will be uh, uh, refunded pro rata. No dividends are paid, completely removed from the equation. You still got a margin and deposit uh, required, traded on the exchange, issued over again shares, indices, commodities, FX. But it's more complex pricing in a futures environment. It absolutely is more difficult to manage that pricing. And I'll show you why here. So we've got three examples. A share at 100 Rand, your CFD would cost you 100 Rand. Your futures contract would cost you 103 Rand. Now that 103 Rand is the interest component between now and expiry. Let's say expiry is three weeks time, effectively it's one Rand per week. So if the share doesn't move in a week's time, that futures contract is 102. And then the following week it would be 101, and then at expiry it would be exactly 100. But it does make that pricing less clear. If you go for the quantity 250 each, your margin requirement that you're going to be paying on the futures contract will be slightly higher. Your exposure is going to be exactly the same in all cases. You've taken 250 and your gearing will be slightly lower on the futures contract because of that extra three round you paid in interest. Now, if you held that CFD for the same period of time, we could assume that you would pay exactly the same three round in interest, assuming that the providers charge the same amount and same interest rates. But it just gives you a much cleaner price, a much simpler process. You just, you, you're at that spot rather than having to do futures prices. I trade a lot of index futures, Aussie futures, and you know the, the top 40 is X, that futures contract never trades at X until that final expiry day when I'm not trading in it anyway, I've then moved on. So let's look at, at some of the underlying assets that we can commonly trade with a, a CFD. Indices, index is a basket of shares. So, and there'll be a methodology towards that basket, in other words, how it is constructed. Top 40 is the 40 largest shares on the, the JSC. S&P 500 is the 500 largest US listed stocks. And they just get put in, and the bigger you are, the more influence you have. So, the S&P 500, Apple, biggest stock, has the biggest weighting in that index. Indices have less risk of single event, and therefore less volatile. Now, if you were watching markets in late March and you saw 12% moves on any one given day, you're thinking less volatile. But if an index is moving 12%, there are shares that are moving 20 or 30%. They're not immune to volatility. And when a global crisis happens, such as a pandemic or the collapse of a global financial crisis of 08, 09, then absolutely we're going to see volatility in, in, in the indices. But because indices are a collection of shares, you know, for example, today, NASP has some process, very strong, the Indy strong, but commodities under pressure, the resi under pressure, so different parts of the index were moving different directions, which makes it less volatile. What's very important with an index is they trade in points, not cents. So whereas with a share or a commodity, you're paying rands and cents, you're paying dollars and cents, depending on what that is. In an index, you buy or sell points. So a top 40 index is 47,518 points. You'll buy or sell at 47,518. And then you will make a profit per point that it moves. And that profit will be set by the, by the, the, the platform and determine you're going to make X per point if you've gone short and it falls, you will make a profit per point that it falls. 
if you go long and it rises, you'll make a profit per point that it rises. So it's the profit is going to be either in rands or dollars, depending what you're trading, and it'll be on that czar or, or dollar per point that you trade. The example I've got on the side over here, we're looking at a screenshot from Think Market, and in this case, we're looking at the S&P 500. And what you're doing is trading at the points. What you're not doing, that's not the price that you pay. What you pay is a margin requirement. So the margin requirement in the S&P 500 for let's say $10 a point will be set by the provider. And every point, every, every contract that you take out will then give you that profit or loss per point and you pay the margin. So don't look at that and think, yo, hang on, am I paying 2,900 and something dollars for, no, you're not. You pay a margin requirement, you're trading the points as they move. Equity, share traded on an exchange, they are volatile, they do suffer from single event risk. You know, great results, poor results. Uh, pick and pay yesterday. The results were okay. HEPS was down a few cents, call it flat. Uh, dividend was passed uh, and concerns around their trading uh, post uh, lockdown from 27th of March uh, and their inability to sell about 20% of their products, tobacco, clothing, alcohol, you know, general merchandise, etc. Stock, 10% down. You know, CEOs get fired or hired, shares go into bankruptcy. That is the single event risk, which is why I am, which is why I'm an index trader. Yeah, you know, pick and pay down 10% yesterday, top 40, doesn't know, doesn't care. Now, certainly there was money to be made on that pick and pay move. It collapsed down, you could have made money on the downside, take your profit, and you then could have made money on the upside. So there's two ways, you know, you can make money in both directions, but it is a lot more volatile. And companies have a habit of occasionally going bankrupt or going at least into business rescue. You know, just in the last week, Comair and Pomela Gaming, both into business rescue. And the last thing you want to be is in a derivative position and something that then hits business rescue. So shares have a lot more volatility. Now, volatility is great if you're on the right side of the equation. If you're taking a short position on pick and pay on Monday, you were smiling all the way through Tuesday as that share was collapsing. But that knife cuts both ways. And sometimes you will be on the wrong side of that position. Sometimes you will take a long position just as results come out and results are terrible and stock collapses and you get carried out. Remember, because of the gearing, 10% 10, 10 move down in pick and pay. If you were short, your profit's going to be about 100%. But if you were long, your loss is going to be about 100%. And that's that amplification in that move. And then FX. So FX can be complicated, although it can also be quite simple. I'm going to explain how it works, currency pairs and the like. But truthfully, if you just look at the FX chart, and if you think that line is going higher, then click the buy button. And if you think that line is going lower, then click the sell button. It, it, it's just as simple as that. If you think, and by the line, I mean obviously the price line. If you think that price line is going up, you click the buy button. If you think the price line is going down, you click the sell button. Uh, majors are euro, sterling, yen, and USD. Uh, this, when I trade FX, these are the only ones I trade. I don't trade the miners. Uh, the presentation I do in June, I'll talk around creating your own structured products. Um, to protect yourself under, you know, during the pandemic and protect your portfolio. And in that space, there certainly is perhaps a place to put a hedge, in a sense, using uh, 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 sort of the miners. And here I'm thinking particularly the czar, Aussie dollar, and others. But to my mind, trade those major currencies, the euro, the sterling, the yen, the dollar. And you trade them relative to each other. So euro yen or euro dollar or sterling yen, or in the case there, I've got sterling USD, typically referred to as cable. You, pound will be your base currency um, the, in the, the, the exchange rate listed represents how much of the second currency you're able to purchase. FX is a 24, five, 24 hour a day, five day a week market, opens Monday morning Sydney, closes Friday evening New York and trades all the time. Obviously it's busy time is sort of from late afternoon our time, sort of three o'clock or so, three, four o'clock as New York is opening, through to about 10 and 11 o'clock at night as New York is closing. We then move into Asia. That's typically a fairly quiet time. There's activity happening, but it's a lot quieter. A lot of activity will be happening in the yen, 
could be happening in the Aussie dollar and the like. Um, and then as the morning comes through uh, and Europe starts to wake up, we start picking up some traffic again. This is the most liquid, largest market in the world. It is, it is the, I mean, the, 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 the volume and value going through your FX market on a global scale is factors larger than the entire global uh, uh, equity market. It is ginormous for two reasons. One, because there are traders such as us out there who are busy trading in this particular space, but also because global commerce is happening in the place. You know, our rand is moving in part because they're traders in the currency, but also because, you know, people are buying and selling the ZAS. They're buying it because they want to take, you know, they, they want to bring some money in or the exporters and importers. So we see a lot of transaction happening in that FX market. It trades at the fourth decimal. So we're looking here at the US, uh, Euro USD, uh, 108,189, um, and that is that last eight, which is really the point that matters. Now, it goes down to five, but that fourth decimal is where we're going to be trading. What we're seeing there is a spread of 1.2 pips. Now, pip is a hundredth of a cent. And these are, we're talking, I mean, your spreads on the FX are absolutely tiny. It is the least volatile market. That pair there, Euro USD, has never moved. Okay, I'll take that back. Last time I checked the data, which was about a year or so ago, has never done a 2% move in a single day. Currencies don't, you know, the, the miners, yes. I mean, the czar, absolutely. Aussie dollar, uh, you know, the, 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 the rimbi, the real, the ruble, those, those, yes, 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 they are volatile. But the majors relative to each other are not volatile. Question, why don't I include Swiss franc? I know that typically... Um, and if you go to the Think Markets website, when they mention majors, they mention Swiss franc. Most people will consider, consider the Swiss franc to be a major as well. I don't for a simple reason, because a couple of years ago, they pegged their currency and then they lifted the peg. In other words, they manipulated their currency. And that's the politest way of saying it. I mean, you know, they were trying to protect it, whatever you want to call it. They went in and basically tried to keep their currency at a set level. And then one day they said, oops and they yanked it away, and things collapsed. Uh, brokerages went out of business, never mind just clients. From then on, I don't consider it to be a major. Uh, currency manipulation does not qualify you to be a major currency. Huge liquidity, great place to be trading, uh, low volatility, but there are two things you need to be careful of. The first is excessive gearing. Now, truthfully, that's your remit. You know, you, you can take up to 500 times gearing, but you don't want to take 500 times gearing because if something sneezes against you, you are totally and absolutely wiped out. The second point is that because it's such a large liquid market, the best traders are in the world are trading FX. So uh, the, the, the guys at JP Morgan and the guys at City Chase and all the other, you know, they get their best five traders. They give them... $10 million and say, go trade FX. Now, this is a zero sum game. For me to make 10 bucks, somebody has to be losing it. In other words, you are going to trade against the best traders in the world. Don't do that as a novice. To the earlier question, is derivative something I should only do when I'm more experienced? Yes. And FX at the end of it. Typically, I say to folks, start trading indices. Start with an index. Nice and simple. Then you can move to equity, and if you still want, you can then step up at some point to FX. How long is that transition going to take? Weeks, months, years? Not sure. Remember what we're doing here when we learn to trade. We're learning a skill that, 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 that stays with us forever. You know, it's like this riding a bicycle. You haven't ridden a bicycle in how many years? But you get back on, and you'll ride it first time. And this is the same with learning to trade. We're learning a skill. So as much as I love FX, You've got to be careful of it. And the 24-hour nature of the market, and these days with online platforms and the like, you know, stop losses, et cetera, that, that, that 24 nature is less of an issue. But what it does in terms of getting out and getting stopped or getting orders filled at profit, what it does, however, mean is that there might be you know, a great buy signal at 2 o'clock in the morning, but you, like a sensible person, were asleep at 2 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> Let's look at fees. Bunches around fees. So firstly, what is the fee per transaction and is there a flat or a percentage? So what some people will do is charge a percentage and a base fee. So they'll charge you 1% plus 60 Rand and then VAT on top of it. 
you really just want to pay. I, I suppose either is fine, but you, you want that, that transaction fee to be absolutely as small as possible. You also want to check if there is a minimum fee. There's no benefit, particularly if you've got a smaller account. You know, if you're coming in and you've got a you know, million dollars, well, then minimums aren't of any concern to you because you're trading well above the minimums. But what some will do is say, look, our fee is a 0.7%, minimum 150 rand. Which means that if you do a small size transaction, you're actually paying 150 rand, and that could effectively be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5%. You want that fee as small as possible. So very important that you either no minimums, which think markets in their, on their local product, there's no minimums. You don't want the minimums. And if there are minimums, you've got to make sure that you're trading bigger than them. In the ideal world, you want a simple fee structure, nice and transparent. You want to know what interest is charged for CFDs. What's the interest rate when you're going long? What's the interest rate paid when you're going short? It's not going to be, you know, the interest you get paid when, you, when you're going short is going to be tiny. And if you're trading a, 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 a US and European product, it's probably going to be nothing because it might even be uh, that you pay because of the low interest rate environment. And this is not how we're making our money. But know what it is. You know, if someone's charging you 20% uh, for your long trades, yo, hang on a second. You know, you've got to make that money back before you're actually winning. Are there monthly admin fees? Are there data fees? Do you pay for the charting packages? All of those sort of questions. You know, and it's a case of, you know, fees are exactly, we need to look at trading as a business. And if trading's a business, then we've got to say to ourselves, okay, trading's a business and there's two parts to a business. The one is revenue, income, and that's your profitable trades. The other is expenses, and those expenses will be losing trades, but it'll also be those fees that we are charging that we're paying, whether it be for data, whether it be a, a platform, an admin, an admin fee, uh, you know, the transaction fees we're paying. We want that as small as possible to make it properly viable. If the fees are too high, you know, trading, trading derivatives is really about making money on the margins. You're making a little bit here, a little bit there, you're losing a little bit here, a little bit there, and then occasionally you have that great winner trade. But if you're, if when you're making a little bit here and there, you make less because of fees, and when you're losing a little bit here and there, you lose more because of fees, it becomes a significant drag on the portfolio, on, on, on your performance. Counterparty risk. So if you're buying or selling a share on the JSC virus stockbroker, and I stress stockbroker, there's no real worry about counterparty risk. The JSC guarantees it. Uh, they will back it up. They've got a billion plus in their balance sheet. Everything is quite fine. But as soon as we're trading CFDs, and I mentioned right up front that they are what we call OTC, over the counter. In other words, they don't trade on the exchange. Therefore, we don't have that exchange protection. So exchange traded products have got that protection in case of default, not the company that you bought. If you own Comair and they go bankrupt, you've got no protection for that. But if your broker goes bankrupt or if there's some cookery happening or something like that, the exchange steps, steps up. Over the counter, you've got that counterparty risk. In other words, you know, what happens if a client loses a large amount of money and can't pay? Well, can they absorb that? Can they manage it? What happens if the company that you're trading with simply goes, 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 goes out of business? You know, how safe is your money? So you need to check your counterparty risk. You need to see if they're a listed company, you can go see a balance sheet. But even a balance sheet, I mean, T's and C's, understand that different territories will be potentially ring-fenced. Insurance, think markets has a million dollar insurance co co coverage per client. You know, that, that's proper. So, you know, the, the, the key definition of a bucket shop is someone who, you know, you can't get your money out of, and then one day they're just not there, and your money has disappeared with them. You don't want bucket shops. You want to make sure that your counterparty is reliable, will be there in the morning, and that if things do go wrong, such as when the Swiss franc lifted their peg and, and, and you know, businesses went out of business, are you still able to get your cash? That's what matters to you. So there are a lot of, you know, and, and I see it also in the fee space. You'll see, uh, we don't charge fees. No, you have to charge a fee. There has to be a fee. 
you know, because there are costs to run a platform. There has to be a fee. Don't tell me you don't charge a fee. If you tell me you don't charge a fee, what that means is you're hiding the fee somewhere, and I don't know where, and I'd much rather you actually just properly charged that fee. And then the others who, you know, uh, uh, lowest this, whatever, et cetera, et cetera, they make it sound great. But can you get your money out? What happens if they disappear in the morning? That's your problem. That's your risk. So, so com concluding thoughts. I've run my time a bit, but we'll take some more questions. I'm not overly stressed by that. I'm in lockdown and the president only speaks in two hours, so there's no major rush. Most important, deciding what you want to trade. You know, are you trading FX indices, equities, commodities? I mean, I, I haven't touched on commodities, but in essence, the commodity is very much akin to an equity. Trades in, in, in dollars is mostly the case, but you know, you, the classic one is gold. Uh, uh, oil has been a, a big favorite in the last month or two with the collapse and then, to a degree, the recovery in the oil price. Um, I've never really traded commodities. Um, truthfully, I, I suspect because you know, when I, was, when I was trading more products, these days I just trade indices, when I was trading more products, there simply just wasn't an easy way to trade commodities. Now it's become a lot easier, platforms such as Think Markets, trading the commodities has become a lot easier. What do you want to trade? And it doesn't have to be either or, it can be a combination of, you can have different strategies for the different ones, and we'll delve into that much more in next week's presentation. But know your asset characteristics. Know kind of how they work. Know what those drivers are. You know, FX, one of the best uh, uh, comments someone, an FX trader said to me, he said, you know what, when you're trading indices, equity or commodities, the first thing you do when you get your paper in the morning is you go and you look at the business section. When you're trading FX, the first thing you do in the morning when you get your paper is you go look at the front page. You know, understand what drives FX. Understand that non-farm payrolls every month, uh, 2.30, usually our time, depending on, on whether America's in summer or winter, is often a moving in the FX space. You know, it's economic data. It, it can move indices, but you see a lot more of that move happening in FX. So know what those characteristics, know what the drivers are, know what time frames you're going to be looking at, intraday, daily, end of day, weekly, whatever the case may be. Know your platform. You know, the loss, you, when, when, when you're starting out and you're placing your first trade, your second trade, your 10th trade, just the act of placing the trade is nervousness, nerve, nerve making. Make sure you know the platform. Use the demo account so that when you come to place the trade, you're not worrying about which button to press. You know which button to press. You know where to find your portfolio and all of those things. What you're worrying about is, is your trade right? Is it going to make you money? Now, you shouldn't be, but that's next week's conversation. But start with that demo account. Get to the point. I, I say to peeps, you want to be so good at that platform that you could, frankly, work in that call center helping people manage their accounts on that platform. That's how good you need to be. The platform needs to be absolutely second nature for you. You need to develop that strategy, which will be cognizant of what assets you're trading, the characteristics of those assets. And to the question right up front is don't jump straight into derivatives. This is the top end of the pyramid. This is where the risky part comes. If you're saying, well, if not derivatives, where do you start? Well, you start with some ETFs, tax-free account. Then you build that, and then you move into some equity, and you buy some vanilla shares, and you, you watch them, and you see how they perform. And then you move from there slowly into derivatives. You jump straight into derivatives, especially if you jump straight into FX. You are, with respect, going to lose your money. Attend other events. I mean, get smart. You know, these days the events are all going to be webcast. Uh, we've always been webcasting our events, but even more so. Attend events. Uh, this one, we've got some other events coming up. I'll list them on the next screen. Um, there's tons of them out there. Watch videos on YouTube. Go to justoneup.com. Have a look at our videos. Go see what they've got on the Think Market. Get yourself smart. Ask the questions. Come nice and prepared. Know what you're talking about. Absolutely make sure that you know what, you, what you're talking about. More events coming. So we did the thought leader last week for 3rd of June. I put, went up today, pandemic investment scenarios. The series we're currently in now, ins and outs of derivative trading, uh, trading 101, which will help you improve your win loss ratio. And then particularly that using that website, the Think Trader website. Um, 
and then contact details for everyone. Uh, welcome to take questions now. I'll run through a bunch of them at this point now. You're welcome to obviously contact the Think Market. They've got a 24-5 customer support email and telephone there as well. Legal disclaimers. Someone said, please go back to that page there. You can book through the Think Market, so you can book through the Just One Lap. Let me see what questions and Q&As are coming. Uh, does trading indices mean ETFs? Zaya, it absolutely can. I mean, I, I have traded and do trade ETFs. So I trade the top 40 at the same time. You can trade a CFD in the top 40. You can trade the Aussie. But you can also just trade that top 40 ETF. In other words, a CFD on it, as with the other underlying indices as well. So, yep, you can be trading uh, ETFs because ETFs are essentially a listed product tracking an index. More questions coming? Uh, Mark, is there a daily mark to market done in your account on equity CFDs? Does the broker move cash in and out depending on your PL? Do they just hold the full margin as security for the trade? So some brokers are going to do a mark to market essentially. And, and with, with equity, mark to market is quite simple. Mark to market for those who are saying, what the heck are we talking about? Mark to market is essentially the closing price. On a futures, it's the theoretical price. On a CFD, it will just be the price. The question then is, is your profit flowing in or out? Some will say that profit only flows when you close the trade. Others, other uh, uh, platforms are going to take that profit on a daily basis. My preference is to do it on a daily basis. And I'll tell you why. Because particularly because if I'm in a losing trade and the money hasn't gone, I can pretend to myself that, uh, oh, you know, I'll be okay here. There's no problem whatsoever. Uh, I'm with another brokerage. They're charging me brokerage and comp for my CFD trading. Monthly fees, so costs are getting high. Uh, yeah, so I think markets charge 0.2 com, no minimum. I mean, it's worth, it's an anonymous question. It's worth having a look-see. Head over to the website, open an account, contact the support peeps, um, but particularly for smaller accounts. And, and, and as I said, you know, for your smaller account, and you say, I can't see the zeros, 3,000, a very small account, you need to get those fees down as small as possible. Anonymous, short answer, yes. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm not seeing more questions coming through. Um, cool, we will park it there. Uh, video will be online, let's say, tomorrow morning. We'll put it up on the YouTube channels, etc. Uh, always a pleasure, Mark. Um, and we'll be back again next week. We look at uh, Trading 101, starting simple, week after, using the website. And then we come right back again, 3rd of June, pandemic investment scenarios. I'm putting my head in the block here. Basically, I'm saying this pandemic goes, there's a high road and a low road. Okay, it is going to be fixed by the end of the year, or it's going to be fixed by 2022. What are those two scenarios? Herbert, absolute pleasure. Jacques, Tanek, always a pleasure. Red one, always. Um, and what are those two scenarios? How do we determine which scenario is currently playing out? And then how do we invest accordingly? Things such as, can we make our own structured products? We absolutely can. Thanks run all of this. So that will be 3rd of June, and then again, we'll run the series. So June, and again, July. Hey everyone, have a good evening. Stay safe. Uh, wash your hands, and let's see what the uh, president has to say later this evening. Are we going to get tobacco and alcohol back, or maybe we're just going back to level five and no more pizza? Barry, absolute pleasure. Cheers all, Christo. Everyone, have a good evening further. Cheers all.